Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the GLOBE webinar series on the future of global governance. I am Carrie Otterburn of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, and I will be moderating today's discussion. Today, we are joined by Professor Charles Roger to discuss his latest book, The Origins of Informality, Why the Legal Foundations of Global Governance Are Shifting and Why It Matters, published this year by Oxford University Press. Charles is an assistant professor and research fellow at the Institut Barcelona de Estudis Internacionales. Before joining eBay, Charles was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto. He has also worked with the United Nations and other organizations in various consulting roles, including as a member of the UN High-Level Expert Group on Climate Change, Energy, and Low Carbon Development in Africa, and as a contributor, contributing author of the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Also joining us today as discussant is Dr. Ayelet Berman. Ayelet is Senior Research Fellow at the Center for International Law and Adjunct Assistant Professor at the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law. She is Vice Chair of the American Society of International Law International Organizations Interest Group and is a member of the Academic Advisory Group of the OECD Partnership for Effective International Rulemaking by International Organizations. Her work focuses on the law of global governance, global health law, and international investment law. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation by Charles of about 25 minutes. Then Ayelet will start off the discussion by offering her reflections and asking a few questions. And Charles will have an opportunity to respond. Then we will turn to questions from the audience. Feel free to send questions to me throughout the webinar by using the webinar chat box function on the side of the webinar window. I will collect your questions to share with the speakers following the presentations. Before we begin, just a few words about the GLOBE project. Funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 program, GLOBE seeks to understand the constraints and opportunities for the European Union in it promoting its interests and values to global governance, with specific attention to four key areas, trade and development, security and migration, climate change, and global finance. The three and a half year project aims to identify the major roadblocks to effective and coherent global governance by multiple stakeholders in a multipolar world, as well as to look ahead to 2030 and 2050 in order to equip policymakers with the tools they will need to deal with future challenges. On behalf of the GLOBE project, I would like to thank both Charles and Ayelet for joining us today. And now it is my great pleasure to give the floor to Charles. Charles, you have the floor. Wonderful, thank you, Kari. And uh, thank you to everyone who is joining us. It's a real pleasure to be able to finally uh, present this work, which has had a uh, fairly long gestation period. Um, the motivation for this book is uh, my ongoing fascination with uh, the major transformations that are occurring in our system of global governance. And I focused in my research on a number of different aspects of this. Um, early on and, and to this day, a, a major focus has been on the shift towards uh, private forms of governance or hybrid forms of public-private governance, particularly in the area of climate change. Um, but for this project, I was particularly interested in some of the changes that were occurring in the public sphere. And uh, one of the most important aspects of that was growing reliance on uh, informal international agreements, non-binding international agreements, um, and informal IOs, which represented a pretty significant shift from the traditional tools that states had been relying on, such as uh, uh, international treaties and formal international organizations. Um, and these uh, raise a number of puzzles and, and informal IOs I thought were sort of the most interesting and least understood aspect of, of this shift. And, and that's what I want to, I'm going to talk about uh, today and which is what, what the focus of this book is on. Um, and in order to get into that material, um, it's useful to first clarify our terms and to understand what it is actually that we uh, mean by an informal IO. Um, and the best way to do that is to talk about something that we already know, which is formal international organizations, bodies like the United Nations or International Monetary Fund. And international lawyers and political scientists generally think that these share three important characteristics. They're created by states. They ha usually have some kind of body that's independent of those states, so a secretariat of some kind. And they're constituted by an international treaty or agreement governed by international law. Um, and uh, informal IOs share some of these characteristics. They're also created by states. 
Um, but by comparison, they're somewhat less likely to have an independent uh, secretariat. And most crucially, they're constituted by a non-binding international agreement. Uh, and this is really what uh, most sharply differentiates between the two. One's constituted by treaties, the other by uh, something uh, like a memorandum of understanding. Now, these bodies have appeared across a wide range of issue areas from security to global finance to governance of the global environment, and they've been growing considerably over time. So uh, this figure comes from uh, the book and shows my effort to sort of remeasure uh, the growth of these institutions. And it reveals that, you know, starting in the 1970s, there's quite a significant uptick in the number of uh, informal IOs that states were creating. And this led over time to a quite significant divergence uh, and shift towards informality uh, in the universe of, in, of international organizations. And today, informal IOs constitute between uh, 30 and 40% uh, of all of the international organizations uh, that currently exist. So this raises a, a number of puzzles which the uh, uh, book aims to explore. And there's three questions that uh, are the main focus of here and which I'm gonna cover in this presentation. So first, why are some international organizations formal and others informal? Pretty basic, um, but uh, this question is pretty important for understanding the second one, which is why have informal IOs grown over time? And I think we kind of need a good answer to the first one in order to uh, develop a decent account of the second. Um, and finally, uh, in this book, I'm concerned with what the impact of this shift is on uh, the prospects for international cooperation. So I'm trying to understand exactly what all of this means, how it matters. Um, and in this presentation, I'm going to focus uh, first on theory, I'm going to talk about the static theory uh, or what I refer to as the static theory, which aims to answer that first question. Um, and I'm going to then discuss the dynamic account that I offer in the book, which uh, is derived from that static theory, theory and answers the second. Um, I'm going to talk about the quantitative and qualitative evidence that I uh, present in the book. And finally, I'm going to discuss the broader policy implications, answering the third question and, and some future avenues for, for research that I think are important. Um, so the static theory that I develop uh, uh, occurs in sort of two stages. So I, I envision the uh, creation of informal IOs is first involving a preference formation stage where through some processes that occur, visualized here, uh, within individual states, um, they decide whether they prefer a formal IO or an informal IO, and then states come together in a second stage with those preferences and bargain, and that bargaining processes, pro process determines whose uh, preference is going to hold sway when an international organization is actually created. So here we're looking at the uh, preference formation stage, which starts or kicks off with the cooperation problem. And this creates an incentive for states to create some kind of international organization, but it does more than this. It actually also uh, results in externalities that tend to fall on particular institutions uh, within states. They're the ones that care about this issue. Um, and uh, in this account, I identify two important types of institutions within states. Uh, political institutions like the Department of State or a head of state, a very political actor, and independent agencies, something like the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States, the FTC, or in Canada, the Canadian Competition Bureau, these kinds of institutions, which are a little bit more insulated from politics. Um, and I argue that these actors have different preferences over the kinds of organizations that they like to create. So if we consider political institutions first, they're really characterized by the fact that they're influenced by electoral politics. And given that this is the case, legalization or formality helps politicians leading these institutions to demonstrate leadership, uh, which helps to ensure their re-election prospects, uh, always a goal of politicians. And uh, it also helps to lock in their policy preferences uh, and make their commitments to domestic audiences more credible, which also facilitates that goal. And I argue that given these, pref these, these, these uh, 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 preferences, they, this is going to influence uh, their uh, desire for a more formal institution. But formality is actually uh, a, a high bar to uh, get over 
Um, it requires ratification domestically. And this can mean that if a politician faces significant domestic constraints, that path can be actually really quite challenging. Um, so if there's, for instance, a divided government or if uh, a, gov uh, a particular party sort of isn't full in full control of the legislature, um, then th a politician can face significant domestic constraints, which mean that it, a formal organization is going to be pretty challenging to create and they'll opt for an informal organization in its stead, which will satisfy at least some of the domestic constituents in favor of cooperation, um, and at a later point in time might be upgraded to a proper formal institution when, when political circumstances change. In the case of independent agencies, the uh, process is different. So these, as I mentioned, are much more insulated from electoral politics. This is by design. Um, and. Uh, these bureaucrats that occupy independent agencies tend to prefer to avoid politics. They like to make decisions based on their expert authority. And anything that sort of opens up their activities to oversight or, or interference uh, by politicians is something to be avoided. And so they tend to avoid from the, in the first place, uh, relying on a formal international institution. And, and so as a result of that, they prefer informality as their baseline preference if they can achieve it. But now, of course, cooperation problems rarely fall exclusively on a, for, a political institution or an independent agency. Often, there's sort of a mix of institutions in play. And so in some cases, uh, either because uh, the the externalities fall in several institutions or because something's happened and the activities of an agency become politicized, um, then that can actually change the preference sort of dynamic going on within the state and make it more likely that a formal organization is actually going to be chosen. Um, so it's important to emphasize that in this preference formation stage, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the, this theory is determining whether states want a formal IO or an informal one. Um, it's not determining whether one or the other actually appears. Um, this process will play out in different ways uh, depending on political circumstances and institutional structures differently across all of the states that are sort of uh, uh, discussing whether to and whether and how to engage in international cooperation. Um, and uh, so in the next stage, they join each other at the bargaining table and they thrash out what kind of institution uh, that's going to be. And so in some cases, of course, they, everyone sort of agrees that this should be a formal IO or an informal IO. And they might agree for that to that for different reasons, um, but they, uh, uh, or they could be uh, similar reasons. It doesn't matter. The point is that they're in general agreement on the design of this institution. And that leads us to a baseline, a, a sort of expectation of what kind of institution it's going to be. Well, things get more complicated when there's a case of preference divergence where one wants a formal IO and one wants an informal one. And um, in this case, uh, power is going to determine uh, what kind of organization will appear. And I argue that based on sort of basic sort of ideas from uh, bargaining theory that states that tend to prefer informality have a preference closer to the status quo and uh, this can confer on them uh, a bargaining advantage. And when that's the case, uh, we should expect others to sort of uh, have an incentive eventually to uh, defer to that position. But, but often there's actually other possibilities available to um, alternative states, particularly if they can sanction or buy off others. And when they do that, they can threaten to shift the status quo uh, to a new point that creates an incentive for other states to move into uh, uh, their position. And that's going to be particularly relevant, I think, when uh, a powerful state prefers a formal IO um, and others prefer uh, informality. Okay, so this is actually determining what kind of institution will emerge, um, but it only tells us what's going on in sort of individual cases. Um, from this account, I derive a dynamic theory uh, that tries to account for the, the growth of informality over time. And here, my, my idea is that the growth of inform informal IOs has been driven by these big dramatic uh, domestic shifts in the political arenas of powerful states. And there's two that are particularly important here, growing polarization within the OECD, uh, since the, roughly the 1970s, we've seen more episodes of divided government, greater polarization within, dom within domestic political arenas. And according to sort of the, uh, the first dynamic that I illustrated, that should make inform formal international organizations more difficult to create. 
and uh, uh, and then leading to greater reliance over time on informal items. The other aspect of this is the growth of the regulatory state. An important dimension of that shift towards the regulatory state, which has been also very prominent in the OECD, has been greater reliance on independent agencies. And these agencies like to uh, uh, operate internationally as they do domestically on the basis of their discretionary authority. And so when they come to the international arena, they bring that preference and we should see over time greater reliance on uh, informality in line with that preference. So two dynamics, two causal mechanisms, both pointing in the same direction. Now, this is not the only account that's out there. There's also a range of functional approaches um, and that also come in static and dynamic varieties, if you will. Um, the functional approaches broadly say that informality is chosen because it matches the particular type of problems that states face in a particular area. Um, and the dynamic version of that is that as a result of globalization, these problems are becoming more common and then we should uh, naturally be expecting more informality to appear. Another variant uh, is uh, power-based approaches and here again static and dynamic varieties but the basic idea is that informality is chosen uh, when relationships are more unequal and more conflictual and so the expect if we see informality rising then this should be correlated with shifts in domestic power and grow the growth of uh, of, uh, of, of conflicting interests over time. Now, I'm not going to walk through every aspect of the quantitative analysis. Um, these are the baseline sort of uh, model uh, marginal effects uh, that try to test that static theory. Um, so going back just one step. Um, and there's a couple of takeaways from this. First, the two variables that I operationalized, and I'm happy to talk about uh, technical details in the questions. Um, uh, these proved to be statistically significant, substantively important, so might greater sort of uh, involvement of independent agencies in powerful states, greater domestic constraints in powerful states lead, leads to uh, uh, the likelihood that an organization is going to be informal to rise. Um, but this is not the only dynamic. The other explanations do actually uh, have uh, some, some merit, of course. Um, so I find, for instance, when we evaluate power-based explanations that the divergence of interest proves to be really important. So greater uh, divergence uh, and conflict actually uh, tends to produce uh, greater informality. And, but the power, sort of unequal power on its own doesn't seem to uh, do as much work as some might expect. When we look at functional explanations, uh, the results are a little bit more e uneven, uh, but two uh, variables there uh, do prove to be uh, statistically significant as well, particularly of importance, I think, uh, the potential for opportunism uh, in an issue area makes it much less likely that informality is going to be opted for. So this is the static theory um, and provides fairly powerful evidence, I think, for uh, that approach. Um, and I use this data in the book in order to try and sort of uh, uh, get some, get to grips on this dynamic account. And so I use that data to generate predicted probabilities. And these show uh, that the likelihood that uh, informal organizations would, uh, be ch would be appearing would change quite significantly if it was just independent agencies or just rising constraints playing a role over time. Um, and so that shows that these two dynamics uh, have unfolded uh, more frequently over time and resulted in much greater informality. Um, now, again, it's not the case that this is the only explanation. Actually, globalization seems to be playing a role here, changing cooperation problems. But interestingly, shifts in power don't seem to be doing, uh, and, and, and growing conflictual interests don't seem, be, seem to be doing the work. So in individual instances, that can play a role, but there doesn't seem to be some major pattern um, appearing within the states that do get included in the data, which are primarily, I should say, OECD states, um, which is sort of a necessity for this particular research project. Now, um, as I mentioned, there's also a qualitative component to this study. I look at a number of case studies, uh, uh, mainly in the economic arena, in trade and monetary issues, banking and securities, antitrust, so things like the GATT and IMF, which were created in the period 
uh, immediately after World War II. Then uh, we, in the next chapter, after we fast forward to the 1970s, we look at the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision and the International Organization of Securities Commissions, EOSCO. Uh, and then we move forward to the 1990s and 2000s and look at uh, the choice that states made uh, about whether to handle global antitrust issues in the World Trade Organization, a formal IO, or uh, the International Competition Network. So I can only give you a brief uh, overview of what I cover in these cases. Um, here you see uh, in the case of the IMF and GATT, the preferences, preference formation processes as I visualize them in the United States. And interestingly, in the case of the IMF uh, and monetary issues in the 1920s and earlier periods, um, this was primarily a domain where independent agencies, central banks uh, were playing the key role and politicians were sort of on the sidelines. And, uh, in line with sort of expectations, these actors tended to prefer cooperating informally, not necessarily through an informal organization at this point, um, but they had uh, meetings that were quite unstructured. Now, in the 1930s, you know, in the United States with the election of uh, Roosevelt, um, that changes and politicians take on a much more significant role in the monetary arena. The area gets politicized and by the 1940s, when the Bretton Woods negotiations are taking place, it's basically presumed that a formal organization is going to be uh, the way forward. Now, in the case of the GATT, it's a different story. The State Department is the main one that's uh, 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 concerned about international trade issues in the 1930s. And it sort of from the beginning prefers a much more formal approach in the 19, in the sort of early uh, post-war period, it's, it's negotiating an international trade organization, which is uh, supposed to be a highly formalized institution. But in the midterm congressional elections during uh, Truman's first administration, it shifts, things shift significantly towards uh, the Republican party. And uh, so domestic constraints rise, and that makes the ITO effectively uh, uh, impossible domestically in the United States. But in the interim period, states had negotiated an international agreement, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT, um, and uh, this provided an option. It lacked the organizational components that the ITO was to provide, um, but they could build up an informal organization around this treaty and create a formal organization. Now, um, there's sort of two bargaining processes here. In the case of the IMF, there was a, basically a preference amongst most on towards the formal end, although the UK and others weren't sort of uh, completely satisfied with this particular approach as a result of their own domestic constraints. I'm not getting into that story here. The key point is that the United States op uh, uh, was sort of really critical to this and um, and essentially uh, in the negotiate in the sort of period after of Bretton Woods, the UK and others were really uh, very much forced to uh, go in its uh, direction. Um, so that's the story of the IMF. A formal IO appears in line with the preference of the most powerful state. In the case of the GATT, there was a significant divergence of preferences. States had been negotiating the ITO, most preferred a formal pro approach. The USA, uh, uh, its position changed in terms of greater, towards greater formal, informality, excuse me. And others uh, were who were highly dependent on the US in the early post-war period were essentially forced to go along with its preference and they created an informal IO. And interestingly enough, this process replicated itself in the early, in the mid 1950s when states tried to create an organization for trade cooperation. And uh, again, that effort foundered on the shoals of US domestic politics. So the case of the, move, moving forward to uh, the 1970s, in the case of the BCBS and EOSCO, the cooperation problems were arising as a result of the globalization of financial markets. Um, and uh, and um, as these problems sort of came to a head, uh, they fell on very different institutions uh, from what we saw before. In this case, it was independent agencies like the Federal Reserve or the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, and uh, these institutions all had sort of a, a preference for inf informality in their international dealings. Um, and uh, this was the case in virtually all states, um, and especially so in sort of the key ones, the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, now, there was sort of limited politicization. This did get onto the agenda of politicians in the G7, but they were mostly happy to leave things up to 
uh, central bankers and, and financial regulators in this particular instance. That provided a motivation for cooperation, but didn't determine anything. So in this case, basically, the, the expectation is pretty easy. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot to bargain over, actually, because uh, at least on this particular dimension of international cooperation, there were others that were more conflictual. Uh, states generally agreed that an informality was, was preferred. And so informal IOs appeared in both of those instances. Now, finally, moving on to the case of the WTO and ICM, key actors here are the EU and the US. Now, global antitrust issues had been simmering for some time, but they kind of uh, came, rose up the international agenda in the early 1990s. Um, and initially, in both instances, uh, independent agencies, the European Commission, so sort of unusual circumstance there, but in the US, the antitrust division and the FTC uh, were the main ones that were concerned with this issue. And in the EU, uh, and in both cases, an informal organization was uh, the one that was uh, most preferred um, initially. But in the European Union, antitrust issues actually became quite politicized in the early 1990s. Um, there was a ECJ decision against uh, the uh, a European Commission on exactly this matter. Um, and then a whole bunch of other sort of factors that that influenced the Commission's decision to uh, prof to opt for a formal organization, the WTO, despite the fact that actually officials in the uh, European Commission weren't um, so excited about that um, in their own statements. And so they saw it as second best. Um, so it started pursuing this initiative uh, in the WTO. In the case of uh, the United States, antitrusts were still a back burner issue in many, in many regards. These things just weren't topping the political agenda in the US, um, certainly not in the trade negotiations. Um, and so a preference for informality was maintained in that case. So here we have an interesting divergence of preferences and states actually in this case uh, uh, were bargaining over these issues initially in the WTO, and um, the uh, United States sort of dragged its feet, and eventually the U European Union had to give up on its on its proposal and shifted towards uh, the uh, gave up on its effort in the WTO and embraced this initiative that the U.S. was pushing to create an informal organization to deal with informal to deal with antitrust issues entirely outside of the trade negotiations, and that led to the creation of the International Competition Network, which remains the central institution institution in this area to this day. So these are all sort of illustrating these mechanisms uh, that the uh, that we see um, and in sort of a macro sense in the quantitative analysis and showing that actually the sort of uh, 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 causal pathways that linked independent and dependent variables here uh, do seem to have some validity in across these cases. So um, overall, there's a few con important conclusions that come out of this. First, theoretically, I think there's strong evidence that domestic politics and power are driving the design of these institutions in many instances. That's not to say that functional and power-based explanations and their dynamic variants don't get support here. I think that this is actually a multi-causal story. But certainly, uh, given that the domestic uh, angle to this has been generally left out of the literature, I think we would be really missing a lot of the story if we didn't uh, bring these kinds of dynamics to uh, in, into our theory. Um, and from a policy perspective, I think this has important implications. The reason being that functional theories tend to suggest that international organizations are being created specifically to match the problems uh, that, um, that states are trying to solve. And as a result, we should have this sort of uh, expectation that they're going to be efficient overall. Um, and uh, my theory, if you take it seriously, suggests that that shouldn't be the case. And in the final chapter, I actually try to show that uh, informal IOs are, are in fact more likely to be mismatched with the problems that they're trying to, that states are trying to solve than formal IOs. And I speculate about some of the reasons why that's the case. Um, but probably most worryingly, given that states are relying on these institutions more frequently over time, um, the number of mismatched institutions seems to have increased. And I think that that's a worrying uh, trend and suggests that we should have some greater skepticism about the sort of more optimistic claims that are sometimes made about the merits of, uh, of uh, informal institutions. And finally, I just want to conclude by, by highlighting a few, a few future directions for research in the, that I think are warranted in this area. Um, first, now, 
And we still need to understand a lot about the emergence and growth of these institutions in non-democratic states in the developing world. The sort of realistic constraint in this project is that I focused on OECD states. And the reason being that they are the main creators of international organizations overall, and they're primarily democratic. And the, the, uh, the model sort of makes assumption that that's the case and the evidence focuses on those institutions um, or those states. And um, I think that uh, that tells us a lot, but it obviously doesn't tell the whole story. So we, there's a lot there that we still need to understand. I think also we need to take into account that these institutions aren't static. They change over time. They become more formalized or informalized. And, and I think that this is a really uh, exciting avenue for future research, particularly because it might tell us something about how to address those policy problems that I highlighted before. Um, we also need to understand the, and related to this, uh, the effectiveness, the accountability, the legitimacy of these institutions. I include a number of speculations in this project about each of these questions, but there's still uh, a lot more that we need to understand. And finally, um, towards that end, I think there needs to be a lot more dialogue about informality, informal organizations, but also other varieties of informality across disciplines um, in comparative politics, sociology, law, where all of these different things are being addressed. Um, and then also from research, different research traditions. So one of the theoretical sort of uh, uh, approaches that's often used in IR is uh, uh, constructivism. And, and that's really kind of absent in, in this particular account. Um, but I think that actually that particular uh, 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 research uh, approach has actually a lot to say about, about these issues. And so I'd like to engage in more dialogue with, with people coming at it from that perspective. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for uh, your attention. And Ayala, I look forward to your comments on this project. Uh, thank you very much for this in very engaging presentation, Charles. And next, I will be giving the floor to Ayala to kick off today's discussion. Before I do so, I would like to remind the audience that the Q&A will begin soon. And I invite you to send me your questions via the chat box on the bottom. I noticed that some members of the audience have raised their hand. Um, it's actually more, it's actually a bit easier for us if you can just send the questions via the chat box and then I can read them out. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to send those to me via the chat box. You can also send me a message if you need um, some other, if you have some other question not related to the presentation, that's okay too. All right, so uh, Islet, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, uh, to Charles for an excellent presentation. Thank you very much to the Live in Center for Global Governance for having invited me. Um, I really want to, I want to start by congratulating you on the book. I think you, you have an amazing achievement here and I think there are three major achievements in this book. So first of all, you make an amazing job and you know, you have a, a major empirical investigation going on here into the, uh, as to the impact of domestic politics on institutional choice, um, and then beyond that, I just I just like the writing style. It was very nuanced and systematic in the approach, in your approaches and in your arguments, and overall it was just well written. So it was qu quite an easy read, I have to say. So just to say from the outset, before I get into my comments, that I really think that um, it's 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 a, a very important contribution to the literature, and I've personally already recommended it to others. So let's start with that. So um, the book looks at the phenomena of international informal organization and essentially seeks to answer three questions. What is happening? Why is it happening? And how does it matter? So um, I'll try to follow that order in my comments. So first of all, regarding what is happening. So as you've just uh, presented to us in the first part of the book, um, do you hear that thunder in the background? Is that creating noise for you guys? Yes? No? Okay, fine. Because there is a lot of thunder here. Okay. So in the first part of the book, you carry out a quantitative study mapping out uh, the rise of informal organizations. And on that part, I have three uh, main comments or questions. So first of all, I think the mapping exercise is really a major contribution to the literature because as you point out, um, and as I well know, really most of the studies out there are anecdotal case descriptive case studies. If we look at uh, projects like the GAL project or the informal international law project, which I was involved in. So, and all, you know, we have so much secondary literature. So I think 
that's going to be really a, a helpful contribution. Uh, my second comment concerns um, the choice of, of informal organizations, which you've looked at. So you basically, the study really looks at informal organizations which are composed of governmental actors, but doesn't include those composed of governmental and non-state or private actors. And I would have been happy to, um, to have those public-private uh, bodies included uh, because I think that's where a huge chunk of the informal organization is taking place. And, um, and I think you would actually, you know, I'm thinking of bodies like the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, or ICANN in Internet, or ISO. I'm sure you know all of these organizations well enough. But so I think if you would have included them, um, the number of informal organizations would have been, you know, even much higher, and not to speak about the gap with formal organizations. So we'd even have a much more dramatic outcome, I think, than what you found so far. And I also, I think it's important, I, I, the, the thing about working with non-state actors, I think, or including these organizations is, is you know, the way I, I've seen it in my work, is that actually uh, the desire to work with non-state actors has actually been one of the drivers of regulators uh, to, collaborate, to collaborate informally, because under international law, if you have a pr private actor um, involved, you actually can create a treaty. So by definition, you, you get an informal um, organization. Um, maybe I'll say a little bit uh, more about why, why regulators want to collaborate with private actors um, soon. So anyway, so I thought maybe, you know, for future research that might be, um, sorry, I got something to, to consider. And I guess my question to you here is, why have these public-private organizations been in, excluded? I mean, is that a theoretical uh, choice that you've made, or is this for methodological or data data uh, reasons? So I'd just be interested to to know about that. Uh, the third comment I have here is, um, I mean, the mapping exercise itself doesn't distinguish between policy fields, but nevertheless, if you would have any kind of insights to share with us regarding um, variations between between different policy fields, that would just be interesting to to, to learn about that. Uh, this brings me to the second issue, which is why is this happening? So here, essentially, you, you know, you address the question at two levels. First of all, you have the theoretical level, and then you carry out the empirical study. So at the theoretical level, uh, my comment here really relates to the, the novelty of the domestic politics theory. So the gist of your argument is that the scholarship is mostly focused on functional and power theories, and that, the, and that the role of domestic politics of powerful states has not been sufficiently been accounted for. And then within domestic politics, you highlight two main factors, which is the increase in political uh, polarization and the rise of the regulatory state. So although you unpack the, you know, the domestic factor, the domestic politics factor very neatly and you know, flesh out the process, I did wonder when I was reading this, is this really a new insight? Because, you know, when you read the work on transgovernmental regulatory networks, Van Marie Slaughter, or the Global Administrative Law um, Scholarship, or also the scholarship, you know, on international soft law, I mean, the premise underlying much of that literature is really, yes, regulators are more powerful, and they want, they want to work outside of the oversight, you know, outside of congressional oversight. And indeed, that's one of the main criticisms of that literature, right? The democratic deficit literature, Anne-Marie Slaughter has an agencies on the loose paper. So in a way, I felt, is this, is this really a new, a new insight uh, which you bring here? And maybe you could just clarify for me where you think that the, that the new, you know, the new theoret um, theoretical contribution is uh, with this argument. Mm -hmm. um, my other comment here uh, on the element of why is this happening is again um, relates to this issue of non-state actors. So your central argument is that regulators act informally because they want autonomy and they want to escape political oversight, and I agree with that. But again, I think another important issue which I've seen in my research is that very often uh, regulators want to collaborate with non-state actors, with private actors. They have so many technical and scientific issues to deal with. Industry is ahead. And essentially, to regulate effectively, they need to collaborate with private actors. But again, under international law, 
once a private actor is involved, by definition, you can't have a treaty. So any kind of collaboration ends up um, being an informal uh, organization. So I think, of course, this is not part of this study, but I think perhaps for, for future studies, this would be something that people might want uh, to consider as, as a reason for why regulators are trying to collaborate informally at the international level. Um, okay, that brings me to the to the second part of the why, which is the, the you know your empirical work, which is really a major contribution. I mean, I was heavily impressed um, both by your quantitative studies and by the comparative case studies, which really kind of look at the entire historical process. I don't know if any other work which has done so. So I think that's no you know with quotes and statements and really going behind the scenes. So I thought that was really really um, interesting and a major contribution. Um, my questions here are, I guess I have two questions. Again, um, in your case studies, you focus on international economic organizations. So how much do you think many of these explanations you know, apply in other policy fields? Uh, would they apply in health, in internet, human rights, and so forth? And the second question I have is, what is the predictive value of your findings or your theory? Um, so the book, the title of the book is The Origins of Informality, and as I just said, I think you do a fantastic work of explaining the history of institutional choice, um, but I do wonder about its predictive value, and I have to say, in all fairness to you, you say again and again that it has no, that you're not making any predictive statements, and you go, you, you know, you, you really go out of your way to set out the limitations, so I'm not saying this is something that I expect of the book, but, you know, just for the sake of the discussion today, and I would say especially given the, the developments that we're in the midst of in terms of international politics. Um, how do you think this will play out? What is your sense? How, how will this play out in the future? And the one thing I'm thinking of in particular is really the US retreat from multilateralism. Because in the end, you know, when I read your case studies, it's quite obvious that the US, the United States in the end determines, makes the institutional choice. So now that there's this retreat or actually attack on multilateralism, what is your sense? How will what kind of impact will that have on institutional choice going forward? Um, and so now I move on to the how does this matter part of the book, which is the last part of the book. And here I just want to highlight several uh, points with respect to policy implications. So I guess I have two main points here. So when I was reading the book, I think it just made it clear once again that informal organizations are really tools for exclusion. And actually, the desire to exclude uh, is what drives them. So in your study, you look at how actually regulators want to ex exclude the political level. And that's actually one of the drivers behind um, their exclusion. But um, what I'd like to add is that also, if we look at informal bodies, many of them have also been used as tools for exclusion of other countries, mostly developing countries, because many of these informal bodies are, have actually historically been clubs of Western countries, and they've been used as tools to exclude uh, developing countries. And in fact, working through informal organizations has been driven by the desire not to work with developing countries and other countries in, 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 form, in international, informal international organizations. Um, so, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, again, we see that informal bodies are uh, ex are tools for exclusion, both in the intrastate level, which you talk about, but also in the interstate level. Um, and of course, what are the, and then, you know, when we talk about the consequences of such exclusion, so one consequence of which a lot has already been talked about is, of course, the democratic deficit within the state, right? That applies within the intrastate exclusion, which you talk about, uh, but I think one element which hasn't received as much attention is really this accountability gap that we get at the at the international level, because uh, we have these informal bodies, many which are club-like, which set rules which are then adopted by many other countries who are not members. So you, you talk about the Basel Committee, which is a good example. It's a club whose standards are really applied um, and adopted in many other countries. So then we get this, you know, who gets to set the rules? Are those that are affected, do they actually get to set the rules? So we get this accountability gap. So I think that's definitely uh, an accountability problem that rises 
both at the in within the intrastate level um, framework, but also in the intrastate. Um, and that brings me to my last uh, comment. Um, and again, so you you conclude with um, with the, with the finding that actually informal bodies are not as good as they were thought out to be because you do this nice study where you actually compare between you know what organizations we would have expected to see based on functional considerations and what we actually got and you find that there is a mismatch so when i was reading that it really did give me a sense of pessimism um, as to the ability of informal organizations uh, to solve international problems and i think um, that adds to the disappointment we also have from formal organizations. So overall, there is like this sense of, um, and certainly these days, you know, with the whole COVID thing, when we look at the WHO, which is a formal organization where we also see that it's not properly managing, uh, the, being, is also not capable of really solving the problem. Um, so at first, I guess, you know, I was very pessimistic, but I think maybe we should look at this as a, you know, as a glass half full issue because, even if we look, for instance, at the WHO, yes, it's not an ideal body, but it still has something, it still has value, it still has something to contribute. So also at informal bodies, if we think of them, yes, they're not ideal, but still many of them have some have value and have something to contribute. And um, therefore, you know, maybe they're not as, as bad after all. So that, that's my comments. And uh, thank you very much. It was really an excellent book. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, should I respond to this? Uh, I can I can try to do it as quickly as possible because they're all really important uh, questions that, that deserve lots of attention. In fact, actually, um, so uh, there's a lot here. Uh, Public-private partnerships are excluded. That's true. That was sort of a methodological decision uh, to sort of keep the unit of analysis as similar as possible. Um, but I do think that in an expanded sense uh, that that this is sort of part of the broader phenomenon of new modes of governance. Um, it's possible that it might make sense to include them at some future time, and there's certainly a lot more empirical work about that, but I sort of just thought rather I would be conservative here and, and focus on this phenomenon, but I actually think that, that what you're talking about in terms of bringing, so it sort of shades into the question about the role of non-state actors, that I think that really is a relevant dynamic for that, right? Um, but also there's a huge amount of research already on public-private partnerships by, you know, uh, someone I've worked with really closely, Liliana and Danova, and, you know, they've done great work. So I, I didn't want to sort of tread that ground. I wanted to focus on this phenomenon. But I think that uh, I, everything that you've said there is really pertinent and, and that this is part of the broader phenomenon, certainly. Um, but it's more of a conservative uh, uh, methodological decision. In terms of policy fields where these are active, I don't have good data on it. I kept on uh, thinking about doing it, but the thing is to do that, you need to code all the formal ones and there's hundreds of those. And um, there, there's just, there wasn't sort of a way to do that that I was really satisfied with that I frankly saw the cost benefit <laughs> tilting towards the benefits of doing it. But I should say as a pitch, uh, you know, I'm, I, I've, greatly extended this data set with uh, a colleague at Oxford, Sam Rowan, and, um, and, and tried to make this thing much more useful for statistical analyses. Um, and a part of that, we haven't gotten there yet, but an ambition is to, to do that. I can say, though, um, that, uh, that you know, they seem to be active across a pretty wide range of issue areas. And I don't uh, have any sort of a real insights into sort of which areas stand out as being exceptional. Um, I know that uh, in other work by Felicity Vabulous and Duncan Snydel, who have done uh, some some very something very similar, uh, and actually my work is extending and building on um, that uh, that they find these are particularly active in security. I'm not sure that I quite agree with that, given the sort of different things that end up in the two data sets, but. I, I think economic institutions are, are all over the place and, you know, security is there, but I don't know. It, 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 coming up with something definite to say about where they're most active in is, is, is kind of tough. Um, in terms of what's new about domestic politics, this is an important question. And I think the answer is that, yes, there's nothing new under the sun. And my work is very much inspired by, by work by, uh, you know, Raymond Hopkins in the 1970s, who kind of focused on the way that bureaucracies interact when they 
enter the international arena through sort of Andy Moravchek, Anne-Marie Slaughter, Chad Damro, and other people like David Buck, who, who have all sort of in various ways tried to think about the way that domestic politics uh, plays a role here. Now, they weren't speaking specifically necessarily about informal IOs, although there is overlap between what they're talking about and what I'm talking about, of course. But to me, uh, the, this hadn't been sort of a real part of the debate on informal IOs as centrally as it, I think it merited, given given actually uh, everything that we knew about it already, um, and uh, that it needed to be fleshed out. But on, on beyond that, it was there were all sorts of sort of loose hypotheses about how that matters. And so for me, it was important to develop a much more systematic model that kind of explained that process. And so that I think the systematicity of the way that I envision the domestic political process mattering is, is I think sort of maybe the key contribution in sort of a broader sense, right? Um, and then the role of non-state actors, I've sort of commented on it. I think that that does matter. And certainly if we expanded the data set and took uh, uh, a wider look at these things, that that would be something that would have to matter uh, much more. Um, um, so yes, the focus is on the global economy. I think that that's less true of the quantitative analysis, but in the qualitative studies, certainly it's heavily uh, focused on international economic institutions. Um, and uh, that was sort of um, to sort of tell a coherent story in some ways, but I think there were also some sort of uh, benefits to these particular cases uh, to look at. Um, but uh, but I do think that this story extends more widely, both across sort of uh, issue areas um, and then also into the future, right? So I think that this does tell us a lot about what's happening with international cooperation today uh, under Trump um, and, and, you know, under Obama as well in climate change, for instance, you know, and, and under Bush. And, and, and so this is something, uh, not something actually that you know, is exclusive to Trump. I mean, a lot of these dynamics have been going on for a long period of time, in fact, right? And and so this is sort of part of that Trump is only a system rather than a symptom rather than disease, disease itself. And so I see this as actually sort of part of that dynamic. Now, whether this dynamic, I, I think in the United States, that's really important, whether this dynamic exactly plays out in emerging economies who are also creating these institutions at an increasing rate, I'm not sure that, that this theory has as much purchase, which is why I think we need to understand those, those actors a lot better, right? Um, so I think it does have something to say about this present moment. Obviously, the further we move into the future, I'm less confident about that. Uh, but I think that I think that this does have some 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 value for here. But if anything, to say it, it's part of that Trump is a, a symptom rather than the disease itself, uh, because this has been going on for a long time, actually. So, and finally, tools for exclusion. I think that that's really interesting and something that I want to focus on more in my future research. Uh, I, I, I sort of speculate about it in the final parts of the book. I don't go into it in, in a tons of detail, but I really think that that's part of what's going on, right? Um, so that's a really uh, welcome thing as well. And so the glass half full, um, yes. Uh, I mean, I sort of think that there's a uh, risk sometimes of being, um, uh, uh, um, saying that this is the best of all worlds kind of thing. And uh, I worry about that argument because sometimes the best of the world, all worlds is, is, is just not true, right? And that's the, the point of Candide, right? And so, so, um, so rather than taking a Panglossian perspective on this, I think that the that the way that I would say this is that it really depends on the issue area and even the like very narrow specific that an, an organization is trying to manage. And then I actually came out of this with a renewed appreciation of the work of formal IOs and informal IOs in many cases. Um, and there are places where informal IOs I think are, are, are really sort of doing exceptional work and areas where they're not, right? And that's the same is true for, for formal IOs. And I think that Rather than these like blanket statements that we see kind of being peddled by lots of people, we really have to have this sort of more micro uh, assessment and, and careful analysis of their appropriateness in many instances. Okay, so I've realized I've taken up a lot of time here, but uh, so maybe we can have at least a couple of questions before the end. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, to both of you for already this interesting discussion. Um, I'm going to start with just two questions for this first round. Um, as we are 
running up against the clock here, but they're pretty good questions, so I think it'll continue the discussion. Um, we have a question first from, actually, I'll do three questions this round, and that'll probably be the only round that we have, if that's all right. Okay. So our first question comes from Elaine Fai from the City University of London. She writes that, arguably, the EU is heavily wedded to institutionalization, both inside the EU as to its own internal actors, quasi-agencies, and many institutional actors, and also externally in the global legal order, for example, the Multilateral Investment Court and the Institutional International Criminal Court. So her question then is, does this book project have any salience for the EU? And then our next questions come from Michael Giesen, who asks a couple of quick ones that are not exactly related, but they're all relevant, so I'll ask them all. Are informal IOs conceptually closer to networks than formal IOs? That's the first one. And the second one is, how would you argue how informal IOs generate authority without delegation? And third, is your data set publicly available? And then our final question will come from Virginia Hoffler, who asks um, whether you have thought about the relationship between formal IOs and informal IOs. Do formal IOs sometimes want particularly difficult issues handled by other organizations, perhaps including informal ones? And uh, I will stop there for now. So. OK, uh, yeah. so I'll try and cover this all in a very short period of time. So uh, does it have salience for the EU? I would like to think so. Um, the EU is obviously a, a, a sui generis creature in some ways. Um, and in some ways, it's useful to analyze it pretty much as a state, and in some cases, as an international organization. It kind of depends on the issue area that we're talking about, because it has different competencies. And the one uh, that I focus on in this book, International Competition Issues, is actually the one where it has the probably the highest supranational authority. Um, so it's probably safest in that particular arena to analyze it as uh, kind of a state-like creature. Um, and there, I think it actually does. This theory sort of, at least as it's presently up, uh, sort of elaborated, is sort of a useful thing. Um, and uh, But that would be less true of other issue areas, I think. Um, but ultimately, uh, the EU is implicated in creating many of these organizations. And the exact dynamics that that of, or, or of, I, of IOs like it uh, in this area is sort of something that I'm focusing on in other research that that I, I don't necessarily have good answers to. But so so my answer is sometimes yes, I think it's useful, and then and that in the other instances we just have a lot more work to do to to really sort of say something certain about that. Um, so informal IOs, yes, I mean lots of what people talk about in terms of transgovernmental networks are like the like informal IOs. I have had a bugbear about the term transgovernmental network because it's pretty use loosely uh, used and it, I, in many instances I find the term calling these things a network sort of actually completely nonsensical because you know something like EOSCO it, it basically is an international more comparable to many other international organizations than to something that's like could be loosely considered a, a network right um, it has a secretariat it, it you know it makes policy behaves pretty much. I mean, it even has a headquarters agreement with Spain. So, so in that, in those senses, these things I think are much more comparable to formal IOs in many instances. Um, but there's other things that people would call networks that I'll call an informal IO. And and I do imagine sort of being more clear about this on, on in other instances because I actually think that there's a specific context where the term transgovernmental network is really appropriate term to be using. But it's about individual officials rather than institutions. Um, and so, so that's sort of partially my answer to that. And I, I, I think I try to deal with it in some footnotes, but, um, but not in extensively, I guess, in the book. But, but watch this space. Um, so for the data set, the data set is supposed to be uh, publicly available. It's not available just yet because uh, Sam and I are doing a whole bunch of stuff with it. Um, but if you email me, I'll be happy to, 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 to have a chat about, about that and make it publicly available. Um, to make it available to individuals. And so uh, for, for Virginia's comment, um, that's really interesting. Um, so, uh, I mean, in some ways, these, these decisions are driven. The fact that there's a sort of opportunism is one of the key variables I think is important. Um, uh, but interestingly, these are institutions are obviously cooperating in various ways. Um, and uh, so in other research that I'm working on, I'm actually exploring how that all comes together, and I hope to get some better answers to that as well. Okay, I think we're running out of time. Thanks so much for uh, staying on time. 
I will forward you the other questions and maybe you can follow up individually with the other yeah, askers. Awesome. So uh, that is all the time we have for today. And I'd like to thank you. Um, thank you and both of you for uh, joining us for this wonderful discussion, as well as to all the audience members for taking part in this webinar. Before leaving you, I'd like to announce our next webinar, which is the 15th of June. And that's with Professor Amrita Narlikar on her new book, Poverty Narratives and Power Paradoxes in International Trade Negotiations and Beyond. And that is also going to be our season finale, uh, so to speak, before we start back up in the fall. So I encourage you to attend on the 15th of June. You can register for that webinar and you can also find out more about the GLOBE project at globe-project.eu. Thank you so much for joining us today and we hope you'll join us again next time. From all of us, thank you and goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.